Career Procedure and Recovery, What You Need to Know. My name is Maureen Rollins, and I'm the Director of Health Promotion and Survivorship at Prostate Cancer Canada, and it's my pleasure to be moderating tonight's webinar. Please note that we are recording this webinar, and it will be available for listening on the Prostate Cancer Canada website in a couple of days, so please feel free to share this link with people in the future. So we'll start with a few uh, housekeeping items. So the ground rules for this evening, uh, Leah, if you could put the slide forward one, please. Um, the expert angle team will attempt to answer as many questions as possible. Unfortunately, this evening we're a little bit running late, uh, so we may not be able to get as many questions in, but we'll see uh, about everybody's availability and try to answer as many as possible. Questions will be answered during the question and answer period at the end of the webinar. And at the current time, all attendees are automatically placed on mute to allow for the best quality audio. If you are looking for further information on prostate cancer, please connect with our helpline at 1-855-722-4636 or email support at prostatecancer.ca. Trained information specialists will be able to answer all of your questions. And now, it is my pleasure to introduce today's guest speaker, Leah Jemenke. She is a Urology Clinic Coordinator at University Health Network. She is the co-lead for the GU Survivorship Program, co-lead for the Urology Quality Team, and co-director of the Prostate Cancer Survivorship Program. Leah has worked with urological and, more specifically, prostate cancer patients for over 31 years. She is a co-author of three prostate cancer self-help books. Leah has been affiliated with Man to Man and Prostate Cancer Canada since first developed in the early 1990s. She has created the Urological Patient Education Materials for University Health Network, and along with Dr. Andrew Matthew, developed the first prostate cancer rehabilitation clinic in Canada. Over the years, Leah has worked with many organizations as an advisor on prostate cancer. She has received many awards for her work with prostate cancer patients and was awarded the Queen Elizabeth II Diamond Jubilee Medal for her work, research, and her commitments to patients diagnosed with cancer. It is my pleasure to turn the webinar over to our speaker, Leah Jaminke. Thank you very much, Maureen, and I'd like to thank you and Prostate Cancer Canada for inviting me to uh, speak tonight. I'd like to welcome all those who have joined in to uh, the webinar, and I hope you will find some of this um, information helpful um, in your journey when you're getting yourself organized uh, for surgery. So today, um, I'm looking at sort of going over some areas, um, psyching up for the surgery, looking at some pre-admission uh, arrangements that could be done um, once before you're in the hospital, in the hospital, and once you're at home. So when you're psyching up for surgery, um, usually you've made a decision, um, and now it's important to move forward in a positive manner. So. When we talk to people about, um, you know, the diagnosis of prostate surgery, uh, everyone responds differently to the news of prostate cancer. So it can bring turmoil into your life. Uh, change is hard for anyone at the best of times. Um, but every life change can be an occasion for personal growth and renewal. And that's something I really like to share with um, all the men and their spouses and their families that I meet because it is a time that many people I have seen over the past 30 years really take this time and when you see them at the other end they really do say that they've had a lot of personal um, growth. So um, it's looking at sorting out your priorities, reflecting on what you have and what you value most. So one of the most important things when you're looking at uh, getting ready for surgery is take the time to learn about what to expect. So you need to have um, what steps do you need to take. So what do you need to do? One of the biggest things that we encourage people is to try to increase their knowledge um, as much as they can. Knowledge is power. 
um, and you can gain that power by talking to your healthcare team. And a lot of people uh, often say, I didn't want to ask a question, um, you know, it was a stupid question. In the healthcare field, there is no such thing as a stupid question. And I really like to emphasize that because any question is an important question. So uh, we as healthcare providers are more than happy to answer any questions that anyone has. The other important thing is to really um, to sort of take notes. So it's good to have like questions that you may have. Um, taking notes if you're alone, sometimes you don't hear everything that's being said. So we really do encourage um, people to bring some them, uh, someone with them. So your partner, a family member, um, a friend, someone who could be your second set of ears um, to your appointments because they can take the notes for you so you can concentrate on really taking in what your um, health care provider is um, offering you in the form of education. Because what you're doing is you're really entering into a partnership with your um, health care team. So it's not one-sided. This is going to be a long-term partnership, and you need to make sure um, that this partnership is going to be an effective one. So one of the things is taking back control of your life. The diagnosis of prostate cancer can sometimes feel that uh, control has been taken away from you. Um, it's looking at your emotions, and no emotion is a bad emotion. So um, emotions are real, and if you're sad, if you're angry, if you're happy, um, there's a lot of different emotions that people go through, and it, it's allowing um, yourself to really deal um, and be okay that your emotions are a natural part of the process, because you are going to experience a lot. And it's also communicating your emotions. So if you are sad, if you're angry, um, you know, it's good to express those emotions. Um, again, when it comes to um, healthcare practitioners, um, the nurses, the physicians, um, we really find that when people open up and, and really allow us to understand where they're at uh, with their emotions, it helps us to offer them support services. So it's easy to stay positive. Um, or for us to say stay positive, but there's a lot of different things that we can do to help you to get to that point. So the other perspective of communicating your emotions is not to be silent. So it's really sort of looking at who your supports are, um, your partner, your family member, your friends, uh, support groups such as Prostate Cancer um, Canada, um, has amazing support groups. A lot of institutions have men that are dedicated to those centers who are an excellent source of, of support. So they really can offer um, a lot of um, encouragement to really kind of help you get through uh, this time. For some people, uh, family, friends, partners, support groups, no matter what you do, it's not enough and there is professional help, and there's nothing wrong with asking for help. Um, a lot of people turn to religion, spirituality, they turn to meditation, and those are all positive um, things that people can bring in to um, help them deal with uh, the journey of, of moving forward with their uh, treatment. So what do we need to do to get ready? Um, a lot of times before your surgery, there's going to be pre-surgery arrangements. There's going to be the pre-admission appointment. Um, so <laughs> we'll look at it uh, broken down into uh, your work, if you're still working, if you're not retired, um, some household duties, uh, some supplies that you're going to need, uh, what to bring to the hospital, um, information for friends and family, and sort of looking at uh, bowel preparation or any other sort of preparations that you need to do uh, before the, the surgery. So when we look at uh, work, uh, for those of you who do work, um, time off is dependent on what you do. So I know usually for any type of surgery, whether it be the open prostatectomy or robotic surgery, the time of recovery is the same, even though the incision may be smaller with a uh, robotic, what we do inside is the same. So the healing process does take about the same amount of time. So we usually recommend for someone who works in an office, um, uh, you know, take about six weeks off um, after surgery. 
there are some people that say, you know, I work at home, so if I can do a few hours uh, during the day, I don't really have to go into the office, I'm not committed to an eight-hour, 12-hour day, then we do say that four weeks is, is about an average. For men who do a lot of heavy lifting, so men like who are letter carriers, men who work in the construction, the mining, um, the railroad, we usually will tell them that um, it really, um, eight weeks would be the absolute earliest and more like 10 weeks because the possibility of developing a hernia by doing a lot of heavy lifting um, is, uh, is a high incident. So we do encourage them to take longer time. Um, I, doctors' offices, surgeons will often do letters uh, for people if they do need them for work. So that's something that um, you should look at ahead of time so that when you're getting ready for surgery um, to ask your doctor for that letter so they have time to get it ready if you need to get it into your um, employer prior to coming into surgery. It just decreases the amount of things that you need to do closer to the time. So things, as many things as you could do ahead of time, the better it is. So looking at household duties, so not everybody is blessed with uh, uh, a spouse, uh, they may not have a lot of family members, family may be living at a different, uh, you know, on the other coast, or they may not have anybody, maybe they don't have a lot of friends, or they don't feel comfortable asking their friends to do a lot of things for them. So it's sort of planning ahead. So um, it's looking at how do I make my life easier, especially for the first few weeks after surgery. So because we don't want people to do a hot, lot of heavy lifting in the first two weeks is always kind of the, the worst in the recovery period, um, is where we say it's a good idea to um, do a lot of the heavy grocery shopping and um, sort of looking at fruits and vegetables that last longer. So probably buying things like berries, um, you know, bananas and having them in the house, are, they're going to go bad in a short period of time. So maybe um, I usually recommend to people looking at things like oranges, apples, pears, things that can uh, be in the fridge for a few weeks and, and not go bad. Um, it's explaining to people maybe making meals ahead of time. So some people say they have no issues with cooking meals after their surgery, but I find some days you just don't feel like doing anything. So if you have some um, good meals that are made up ahead of time, if you have some frozen vegetables in the freezer or frozen fruits, you could do smoothies. So it makes it easier if you have some things that are sort of planned ahead, they're done, you don't really have to think about that. So if you do decide that you need to go to the store, um, you can pick up smaller items that um, aren't so heavy. I always tell people, some people will say, you know what, I was thinking of painting the living room or um, I've got a reno project in the basement after my surgery and it's always like, no, no, no. Like those heavy things, those strenuous exercises, are not something that are to be done uh, before surgery, so, or I should say after surgery. So if people can sort of try to do some of the things, um, you know, beforehand or wait until after the uh, recuperation period. So some of the other things that are good to have are some of the things that you'll need um, after the surgery. So um, for any surgery, we usually recommend showers over baths. So we usually will tell people that it's probably better to use soaps without a lot of perfumes or additives. There's a lot of chemicals in those products. So we usually tell people that it's better to buy um, soaps to have at home um, that don't have a lot of perfumes or additives for their um, showering. It's a good idea to have like a, a, an antibiotic ointment, sort of like a polysporin, uh, to help with the catheter care. Um, usually most institutions will discharge people with laxatives and stool softeners because uh, um, constipation can be an issue after surgery. Um, sometimes the medication that uh, physicians order may not be strong enough, so I always tell people it's a good idea if they just have um, a supply of um, like Metamucil or um, some soft stool softeners or some laxatives at home just so they don't have to go out and get them if they need them. And when they're coming back to have their catheter removed, um, it's also a good idea to buy the incontinence products um, ahead of time. So before you go in for surgery, so you're not stressed that you have to get to the store and try to sort through the incontinent products. Um, you've got them available to you for when you come in uh, for your appointment. So 
usually the day before um, the surgery. So with the pre-admission appointment, you would have had a lot of information as to how your um, institution or your physician likes to have things done. That's where people will get their blood work, their chest x-ray, their, their ECGs, um, any sort of consults that are needed um, are usually organized uh, a week or two in advance in the pre-admission department. And they'll go over information with you about uh, before the surgery and what to expect immediately after. So usually the day before the surgery, most institutions will have some sort of bowel preparation for people to do. Um, it's important that people follow the directions that are given to them. So a lot of institutions, there's no right or wrong when it comes to different protocols. A lot of people will come to me and say, you know, my friend did this, my friend did that. Um, I think it's more physician preference. There is some evidence to support some are better than others, um, but a lot of it is just sort of making sure that um, you adhere to uh, the instructions that were given to you um, by your institution. So what to bring to the hospital? So things that are important would be things like your health card. Um, when you're coming in for surgery, it's important to wear um, Usually hospitals want minimum um, things being brought in. It's less chances of things getting lost and being transported. So I usually tell people, uh, wear a pair of like roomy track pants, something loose that's uh, not tight around the waist, no belt. Um, you're only going to have them on for a few hours, so you don't really need to bring clothes to go home in if you have, um, you know, these pants like track pants and, and a big sweatshirt that you wear into the hospital, you have them for when you go home. Sometimes people forget, um, and it's important that if you do use any assistive devices, um, it's better to bring them into the hospital. Some people don't like to bring things in because they're afraid they're going to lose them, but it really does make it easier if you do use a cane or a brace or splints or any sort of prosthetic, it's better to bring it into the hospital. Uh, it's important to, um, you know, if you have your glasses, your hearing aids, all those dentures, um, those are important um, to bring in with you. Basic toiletries, a lot of institutions do have basic toiletries. Um, sometimes I don't know where they get the toothpaste, um, but I don't really think it is toothpaste. And I think some of the combs and the razors, I don't know, um, they're pretty bad. So I usually tell people, you know what, if you want, don't want like face burn and everything else, I, I suggest they bring their own sort of uh, toiletries into the hospital. So because the length of stay is so much shorter than it was years ago, um, we really used to tell people, you know, bring a book, bring a magazine, bring um, an iPad, bring something to pass the time. The times are so short now within the hospital. Most people are home within 24 to 48 hours. A lot of people say, I never had time to look at my magazine or, um, you know, sort of read my book. So those are things that you may say, you know, if it's a really big book, it's really heavy to carry. I don't really need to bring it in. Um, we do encourage people to bring in, a lot of people will bring in the really heavy house coats. So they're nice and they're heavy and they're cozy um, and they weigh you down like lead weight. So we usually tell people if that's all you have, don't bring it in. Um, most places will just do a gown that you can double up. Um, it's important to have slippers, something that you can slide your feet in and out of, something that are, are sturdy that you're not going to slip. So big heavy house coats, not a good idea. Um, and slippers that are comfy that you can slip your feet into um, are better than some of the paper ones that um, the institutions give you. So those are some of the basic things that are good to bring into the hospital for <clears throat> after your surgery. So like I mentioned, each institution has a different protocol. So it's really making sure that you get all your information confirmed when you come into that pre-admission appointment. It's always a good idea to take a tour of where you're going to be coming in uh, for your surgery. So um, you may think you know where something is, um, and you're, you end up, the day of the surgery, it seems like everything goes blank. And a lot of times when I'm walking past the surgical admission unit, there are people that are standing there with a piece of paper with a panic look on their face. And if I ask them, you know, what are you looking for? I'm looking for the surgical admission unit. And it's like you're right in front of it. So you don't see the forest for the trees. So a lot of times it's a good idea um, to do a tour just to see where the nursing unit is that you're going to be um, staying after surgery. Look to see where you need to check in the morning of the surgery. Check and double check about what time you need to arrive to the hospital. 
Um, those are all things that are important. Um, and it really, once you have all the information that's written down, a lot of people say that having everything for sure really takes off a lot of the um, anxiety. So when people check in for their surgery, usually we start an intravenous, and we do that to administer um, antibiotics. So uh, the, the trend is that people get um, intravenous antibiotics to cover them during the surgery. Um, most institutions will do a clipping. So I say shave because people don't really understand a clipping. With a shave, it really kind of cuts the skin. Uh, we need to have an area that's smooth when we're doing the surgery. Shaves do cut the skin and can introduce bacteria. So most institutions do uh, what we call a really fine clip. So they will cut the hair very close to the skin, but it's not exactly a shave. If someone is having a robotic surgery, just because of the positioning um, of the uh, table, usually your head is below your, your feet when we do robotic surgery. The, the bed is tilted, the operating room bed, so usually we would do uh, TED stocking. So those are thromboembolic stocking, so support stocking, similar to when you're flying overseas or if you're going on a long uh, plane trip. So we usually will put those stockings on for people that are having robotic surgery. We usually will give people uh, medication heparin, which is a blood thinner. So a lot of people say, why did you have me stop my aspirin and now you're giving me a blood thinner? Um, they work in a different mechanism. Um, aspirin usually takes, uh, affects the platelets and it takes longer to correct bleeding. Um, with the heparin, it's a, it's a shorter turnaround medication um, that can be reversed quicker. So we usually don't tell people to stop medications such as um, aspirin unless they put it on themselves. Uh, if somebody, if a physician has ordered uh, things like aspirin, we will usually um, keep it on it. So there's a lot of things when it comes to medication and supplements uh, that you need to follow with what your healthcare team uh, wants. Usually uh, part of the pre-admission process is having an anesthetist or a medical doctor, depending on the condition, um, to look at all your medications and to uh, suggest to you what should be stopped or not stopped before surgery. So um, everyone's a little bit different depending on what their history and what some of the core morbidities are. So all institutions um, have implemented a, a surgical checklist and that's where your surgeon with the surgical team, the nurses come out, they see you the morning of the surgery and they do a marking which is X marks the spot and that's just a confirmation um, that this is the surgery that you're having done. So it's not that they're daft, it's just a surgical checklist um, that we do as a safety for people that are coming in for surgery. At this time we really do reinforce some information so if you've got questions um, this is the time to ask and usually they're pretty good. I wouldn't come in with 50 questions, you're not going to get 50 answered, but if you have some last minute questions, this is the time to ask them. So surgery is usually about um, two and a half, three hours long, and that's the same for open or robotic surgery. Um, so if a physician, a surgeon is proficient and does a lot of both surgeries, um, the average is about two and a half, three hours long. So most people will wake up in the anesthetic care unit, uh, which is the uh, recovery room. Uh, people will have an intravenous uh, that's there usually for about 24 hours to give them hydration. They'll have a drain in the lower abdominal area that's there just to collect any fluid that may be left behind from surgery that's usually removed in about 24 hours. And then you will have the infamous Foley catheter in place. And that is the catheter that you will be going home with. That is your anchor. That catheter is the tube that allows um, the healing to take place when we remove the prostate. So um, the type of dressing will depend on which surgery you had. So if you had the open procedure, usually the uh, dressing is larger because it's a three inch incision below the pubic, like above the pubic area. If it's the uh, robotic, it is a one inch incision near the belly button area with a few sort of tapes around the um, abdominal area. So all decisions um, 
incisions are usually covered for 24 hours, and then the dressings are usually removed the next day. Now, for your family, most institutions do have a designated waiting room uh, available to them. So usually um, people who haven't gone to see them when they did their pre-admission, the nurses are usually very good about um, informing you as to where the waiting room is. And depending on the arrangements you've made with the surgeon, they'll usually uh, come out and speak to um, your, your family or friends uh, within that area. So the most important things after surgery would be pain management. So if you have pain, you're not going to be able to do a lot. So pain management is very important. Um, it's also important to learn how to manage your catheter, and it's important um, to look after the um, incision as well. So we'll go over those things. So with the incisional pain, which is where we actually do the cut for the surgery, it's managed differently um, in different institutions, and uh, there's evidence to support some ways over others. So uh, one of the common ways of uh, controlling pain is through the patient-controlled analgesia, which is a computerized box that's hooked up to the intravenous. And if you have pain, you press a button, and it gives you some uh, medication through the intravenous. So that's usually a narcotic. Um, and again, narcotics are constipating. Um, you're usually not getting a lot of medication, but you are usually receiving it for about 24 hours after surgery. And then once you're eating and drinking, they would switch you over uh, to narcotics in the form of a pill. Now, the other way of managing pain, and this is what we do at our um, institution, is we do uh, what we call a cocktail. So we start off with a Tylenol suppository. Uh, the prostate and the rectum sit closely together. So uh, the Tylenol suppository starts working like an analgesic in the area. We do what we call a regional tap block. So we freeze the abdominal area similar to when you go to the dentist. And um, the nerve endings are frozen for about 18 to 24 hours. And we also give you medication, which is a non-narcotic-based um, medication. It's an anti-inflammatory through the intravenous for 24 hours. So with that um, cocktail, a lot of men are surprised at how little pain they, they do have. So um, when all the intravenouses are stopped, we usually start everybody on pain medication in the form of the pill, and everybody is given a prescription for that to take home. So the biggest culprit, and I have to say, a lot of people don't really complain about their, their surgery pain. What men complain about and what they don't like is the, is the catheter. So what happens is your bladder is actually a muscle. And your bladder does not know what this tube is inside. So there's a little balloon. And I'm just going to move forward here to show you the catheter. So there's a, a little uh, balloon on the end of the catheter. And that's usually filled with about uh, 20 to 25 mils of fluid. And what that balloon does is it puts pressure, because um, your penis is, is here, your urethra, and this is the base of your bladder. And what happens is this balloon pressure um, at the base of the bladder. So what happens is the bladder doesn't know what it is, and it goes into a spasm. And for some men, that spasm can almost feel like you're getting a charley horse, but in the bladder area. So it can be quite intense. It's intermittent. It comes and it goes. It doesn't really last, but it can come at any time. The other type of sensation is that some men may feel like they always have a full bladder. And some men say that sensation can be overwhelming. So there is medication um, that deals with the bladder spasms. So narcotics do not deal with bladder spasms. So most institutions will give people a prescription for um, the bladder spasm medication um, to take home. So if you have spasms, you have the medication readily available to you, and you're not having to call and get a prescription. If you don't have pain, you don't take it. But if you, if you do have pain, then um, you go ahead and take it. So because you're going home with the catheter, one of the biggest fears that men have when they come in through the pre-admission and I'm doing uh, their teaching is, how am I going to look after this catheter? And I always say to them, it's sort of an extension of your body. So if you think of a catheter as an extension of your penis. 
So um, the nurses are going to be instructing you on how to look after the catheter when you're in the hospital. We don't usually um, teach this in the pre-admission department. We do give written information. I find when people are coming in for surgery, they've got so much um, information already that it's an overload. So um, it's much easier for men, once they have the catheter, for the nurses to teach them how to look after the catheter. So in the world of urology, a lot of times people will call and say, my urine is fluctuating from a clear amber to a dark burgundy. In the world of urology, we don't care. Uh, dark burgundy is just old clots that are sitting at the base of the bladder. And when you start walking around, it stirs up those clots and sediment, and it discolors the, uh, the urine. Um, and that's fine. The only time we would really be concerned and the nurses would review this with you if it was like a bright red, uh, like an active bleed. But um, a burgundy, like a Bordeaux, uh, that's old blood. It's been there for a while and it's just sort of uh, being swished around when you're up and walking. So that's nothing to worry about. Nurses are going to teach you how to change a bag. So usually men will have a uh, daytime bag that's strapped onto their leg. It holds about 500 mils of water, and you can be up and about. So um, underneath your track pants, you can't tell, or shorts, you can't tell that you have it on. And at nighttime, we usually have you change it to a much uh, longer tubing with a bigger bag that sits on the floor next to the side of the bed. So nurses will usually review the, the cleaning instructions, and it's actually really easy. We just say when you're in the shower, put a little bit of liquid soap and water, shake it up, and then let it drip dry, and it's ready to go for um, the next time that you're going to change them up. With the incision, a lot of people are, um, you know, what am I going to do? How am I going to look after the dressing? We don't put dressings on the incisions, so it's only covered up for the initial first 24 hours. After that, when the doctors take it off the next morning, it's left open to air. So. Um, we don't want people like taking any sort of extra precautions. Usually, uh, we say when you shower, that's where it's using a mild soap with a lot, lot without. Sorry about that. Without a lot of additives and, and um, perfumes, then you're sort of pampering, like powdering that area with the soap and water. You're letting the water run over the area, and then you're patting the area um, dry. So we also don't like no lotions or creams on the incision because what can happen is the top layers um, of skin. So you don't need to worry about everything opening up. But a lot of times when people put a lot of lotions and creams, it stops the top layers um, from forming a nice seal. So um, it'll heal, but you'll just have a fatter scar. So that's why we tell people it's important um, not to put any lotions or creams for a few weeks on the um, incisions. So usually, regardless of open or robotic, um, men will have staples. And depending on the institution, some people will go to their family doctors, and some people will um, have it removed back in the institution when they're having their um, catheters removed. So when you're going home, it's important to be aware of what the hospital's uh, discharge policies are. A lot of times that information is reviewed with you. They will tell you that discharge time is at this time. Uh, so the, the day that you're going home, we need to have your family members here at this time to pick you up. Um, or if it's somebody else that's picking you up, you need to make sure that you have the arrangement. So we don't like uh, people going home on the subway. We prefer not a taxi. So we do prefer people to have somebody take them home. Uh, we also don't want them carrying um, their things that they brought into the hospital. Um, so we would prefer somebody that would actually um, take them home. So when you're recovering um, at home, this is sort of what I call the second part of your journey. So this is when uh, you're going to do some exercise, you're going to take some breaks, you're going to um, you know, eat healthy meals, and you're going to be drinking lots of uh, fluids. So when you look at exercise, walking is the most effective um, exercise after surgery. It increases cardiac output. Uh, it increases circulation. It increases the oxygenation that helps with the healing. So walking is the be all and end all after surgery. And we usually tell people to start off slow, uh, do three walks a day. 
Uh, you don't need to do a fast pace because that burns a lot of energy. You don't have a lot of energy to waste after surgery, so that's why doing these short walks are better. Uh, walking does help to decrease the chance of, of blood clots um, or developing blood clots in the legs. Um, stairs are perfectly fine. Um, there's no issues with people doing stairs, although they do make them uh, more tired. So I say to people, try to do things if you do have multi-stories. Do what you need to do, your showering and everything, uh, first before you come down in the morning so that you're not having to go up and down, up and down, up and down. So Kegel exercises are important exercises to help um, uh, to uh, not have the stress incontinence. So usually Kegel exercises are taught before surgery. Um, so the catheter is usually in, on average, anywhere between 9 to 14 days. So we usually will tell people to resume their Kegel exercises uh, once the um, catheter is removed. Uh, for six weeks, people, regardless of robotic or open procedure, they are not to do any heavy lifting. So nothing over 10 pounds, because they will get a hernia. Uh, so this includes no abdominal or core exercises. Uh, no biking, no elliptical, because um, again, those do core. Uh, yoga, Tai Chi, the basis of those are, are core exercises. So again, we usually tell people to avoid uh, the yoga, Tai Chi. They can do relaxation techniques, but not to be doing the actual uh, yoga or Tai Chi. With meals, we usually tell people <clears throat> it's a good idea to have smaller, more frequent meals as opposed to a great big, huge meal. It's really hard to digest. It really makes you tired. So we usually tell people to, to have smaller meals and more frequent. So maybe instead of three big meals, you're having like six smaller meals throughout the day. Um, eating lots of uh, fruits and vegetables really helps to uh, increase the fiber in your diet. So it helps to reduce the constipation that can occur by taking some of the narcotics. And by drinking lots of liquid, um, it helps to keep the urine clear. But drinking lots of liquid also helps to uh, decrease uh, constipation. So some of the possible side effects associated with surgery. Um, uh, constipation is... Um, it's not often that it occurs. A lot of people don't say they have issues with it, but it's important to try to avoid it. And we've gone through these. I'm not going to spend a lot of time, but just eating lots of fruits and vegetables, lots of fiber, lots of fluid, walking, and stool softeners um, are, are highly recommended. Um, blood loss with um, operations, it's really not common uh, for people to lose blood. Most people, on average, will lose about a unit of blood which is about uh, 300 mils. So it's the same amount if you were going to the Red Cross and you were donating a unit. So it's negligible differences between the open and robotic um, when it comes to blood loss. Um, again, blood loss is dependent, again, uh, with the number of surgeries that people do in their experience. So experience does play a big factor uh, with blood loss, but most institutions do not transfuse the way they used to. So transfusions are not common. There are scenarios uh, where there are people, if they have a really large prostate, um, the surgeons, um, if a prostate's over 100 grams, the surgeon realizes that that person is probably going to bleed more during the operation. So they may recommend to that person that you donate a unit or two to the autologous because more than likely you are going to need a transfusion, so it's better to get your own blood products back if you need to. Um, we always look at religious restrictions, so we do observe um, any uh, religious uh, restrictions when it comes to blood products, and that's where uh, it's important to sort of, um, you know, share this information with the healthcare provider so we can do better by um, the individual. Wound infections are not common. Um, we don't need a lot of, like I said, we don't need a, a lot of antiseptics. We just need to keep the area clean, and we do that with mild soap and water, patting the area dry, no lotions, no cream. Urinary infections, not common. It's uh, drinking lots of fluid, um, keeping the catheter clean. Um, keeping the catheter below the level of the catheter, or sorry, the bladder is very important. 
So that's why we don't encourage men to be sleeping with the leg bags because when urine is in the bladder, it's sterile. Once it leaves the bladder, it is no longer sterile. So if it's sitting in a bag and you're lying in bed and that urine is flowing back in, um, it's going to contaminate and you're going to get an infection. So that's why we have the two different types of bags, the daytime bag that you're up and about, so it sits below the uh, bladder, and then the nighttime bag that pulls the urine away from the bladder so it's not uh, flowing back um, into your bladder and causing an infection. So some of the long-term side effects, I know we're running out of time, um, just a few more slides left. Um, so some of the long-term side effects, stress and cotton, uh, incontinence is common in the short term. Um, there is an excellent presentation by Nelly Fagani on the webinar. Um, she did a presentation on uh, Kegels and pelvic strengthening in 2016, so I would recommend that you would go back and take a look at her webinar um, that she did. Um, biofeedback, uh, uh, Nelly had information on that as well. Um, things like natural diuretics, alcohol and caffeine can sometimes make the uh, the leakage uh, stress incontinence worse. So we usually will tell people to cut back on those things. Um, incontinent products, um, there are, are a lot of incontinence products. Men do not need a full diaper. They just need uh, a guard that just fits into their underwear. So we do recommend briefs over boxers, um, although they do have products that have straps um, for the um, guard. So um, we actually do recommend newborn baby diapers because there's an elastic that goes around the baby's legs. So when men put that pad into their underwear, um, it fits more like a cup. So it fits the scrotum and the penis better than just a straight pad. So a lot of men actually go with the uh, newborn baby diapers. So when it comes to stress incontinence, it is short term. It's usually a few months, a little bit longer. But that's usually uh, with really doing the Kegel exercises um, and having the good um, biofeedback. Urethral stricture, which is a tightening of the urethra. It can be scar tissue that builds up um, in the area where we join the two pieces, the bladder um, and the urethra, back together. It's very rare that it occurs. Um, if it does occur, it's usually at around four to eight weeks after surgery. Men would notice a decrease in their urine flow. So you would kind of think, you know, a week ago my urine stream was a lot stronger than it was this week. Um, so a decrease in the urine flow um, is usually a very strong indicator that there may be scar tissue that's building up and starting to um, cut off your urine flow. So it usually means calling the urologist um, and coming back into the office and having them assess that. So sometimes it's just stretching the scar uh, with some tubing, and sometimes if it's uh, resistant and it keeps coming back, it may need um, the surgeon going in with a, a little uh, knife and a scope and cutting the scar tissue so it stops it from uh, reoccurring. Erectile dysfunction. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. Dean Alterman did an excellent presentation in December of 2016 on the webinar. Um, so he gives a lot of great suggestions, really explains um, erectile dysfunction. Um, so I would say go back to his webinar that he did in 2016. Um, and it really does explain things. So probably the most important take home here is that surgery does not affect um, orgasm, sexual drives, orgasm never ever affected. So it's more the ability to achieve and maintain an erection that are the issues after surgery with uh, nerve sparing. So uh, that's where his presentation uh, would really um, offer some good information for you. So usually your follow-up appointments, um, the first PSA is usually done about six weeks after surgery. PSA does have a half-life. Um, if you remove the prostate, you shouldn't have a PSA reading. It should be undetectable. So PSA becomes a very accurate tumor marker, and the government no hip do cover PSAs after surgery, after treatment. Um, it is covered. So usually the guidelines are that PSAs, if everything is good, is done every three months for about a year. Then usually we stretch it out to every six months for two years, and then every year thereafter you will always have a PSA, because if there's any cancer that returns, 
you'll see it with an increase um, in the PSA level. So PSA does become a very accurate uh, tumor marker. So looking at road to recovery, um, quality of life studies do show that men at one year post-surgery do have a high quality of life. Um, part of the process was getting the information up front. It was making the right informed choices. It's having the knowledge and the skill to help in your recovery, to partner with your healthcare team, um, to make this an uneventful, um, seamless transition. And um, I can tell you that when I see men one year, three years, five years, 10 years, um, literally the most important aspect was that sort of initial um, information gathering um, at the beginning before they started their journey. So I want to thank you very much, and I really appreciate uh, you having me. And if there's any questions, I'm more than happy. I know we're over time, but we started a little bit late. So I'm more than happy to answer any questions. Great. Thank you so much, Leah, for an incredibly practical information. Um, that you provided to us on this webinar. Um, I know myself I had a couple of questions that I figured would come up, but I think you gave some really good tips uh, for individuals, as well as the knowledge of what to expect uh, before, during, and after. Um, just before we go into the question period, you will see a quick poll that has popped up on your screens. We do ask that everyone answers that so we can get a measure of how many people were actually attending the webinar this evening. And once again, as you're filling that out, I just want to remind individuals that this recording will be available online in several days on our website. So Leah, I think most people have completed the um, poll. So um, could you put forward the slide that shows where people can type in the questions? Uh, type message here? Yeah. Yep. Uh, Please. Do you have that on your deck? For anyone who's on the phone, there is a spot on the side panel where you can actually type in your questions. Um, I know a few of you have used that earlier when we were experiencing technical difficulties. Um, you'll see under the um, chat function there that you can type in any questions that you have. Um, in the meantime, I do have uh, a question, some questions that were sent in via email to us. And there was one question. I know you were talking about the fact that the PSA test uh, was covered um, after surgery and the follow-up that occurs, but we do have a question around why more GPs um, don't request free PS PSA tests when they send the patient to get a test done. You mean before surgery? That's correct. So um, the government has issues with PSA testing unless they're being within a treatment plan. So um, there are issues with a lot of false positives. So the government does not cover PSAs on an ongoing basis before surgery, after surgery, radiation, brachy. So after any sort of treatment or within um, active surveillance or um, uh, yeah, active surveillance, um, they would actually um, cover PSAs because they're within an active uh, treatment. But um, other than that, they say there's too many things that can interfere with false positives, um, and it's not an accurate tumor marker. Okay, great. Thank you. Leah, we got another question around, is there one type of surgery better than the other? So whether it's open surgery versus robotic? Nope. So a lot of it is dependent on the uh, disease. Uh, so the, the standard is that uh, although robotic is uh, minimally invasive, so um, you know, your, your, your incision is smaller, but if you uh, lift something heavy with a one-inch incision, you're going to get a hernia anyways. So when you look at who is a candidate for what surgery, uh, robotic is amazing surgery. The visualization is enhanced. It really enhances the surgeon, especially if they don't have a lot of experience with where the nerves are. Um, if you're experienced, you know where the nerves are, so it's not a big deal. The one thing the robot does not have is feel. 
Um, and a lot of surgeons say, even though the robot is an amazing tool, and that's what it is, it's a tool. It's not doing the surgery. It's a surgeon that's doing the surgery. So it's a tool that the surgeon is utilizing. So in some instances, um, when you are in the operation and the surgeon looks, and something can look like uh, a piece of glass, it looks smooth. And when he feels it, it feels like sandpaper. Um, and that's the cancer that has come, uh, you know, uh, closer to the edge or across the barriers. And that's where feel is important. So I know with uh, some surgeons, they will say, I will do robotic uh, surgery for somebody who has a lower stage, lower grade. But for somebody who has more advanced disease, I want to be able to feel as well as be able to see what I'm doing. So they will do an open procedure. Great. Thank you. How often would someone be monitored after they have their surgery? So I know you talked about a lot of self-management pieces and when to be concerned or not concerned, um, but how often would they be monitored? What type of checkup would they expect to have and with whom? So usually um, people would uh, return to the institution to have the catheter removed. Um, so that's usually uh, anywhere between 8 to 14 days. So that's usually when the staples are removed as well. There are people that say if they're coming to the downtown core and they're having surgery from the far north. So, um, you know, they're from Kirkland Lake or, um, you know, some of the really, um, you know, far, far out areas. Um, they're not going to come back here, um, you know, to Toronto to have their catheters removed. Um, so a lot of people will have it removed by their family doctors um, closer to home. So even if somebody lives around two or three hours away from an institution, a lot of times they would have that. But that protocol, so each institution would say, if you're not coming back here to have your catheter removed, then the process is um, the catheter comes out 8 to 14 days. And it's usually not that it has to be in shorter or longer. A lot of time it's more of a... Uh, when the surgeon is available to see the patient in the clinic setting as to when the catheter comes out. So that's sort of just an average with time frames. Um, and, and that's what we tell patients that the family doctor has time between 8 to 14 days. Um, the second appointment is usually at around 6 to 7 weeks. That's with the first PSA after surgery. So we do need a PSA to correlate with the pathology results as to um, was the surgery successful or does that person need to continue uh, with radiation or hormones. So um, if everything is fine, then the usual protocol is every three months that they're followed with a PSA for the first year. And then if everything is fine, then it's stretched out to every six months for two years. And then every year thereafter with the PSA. Great. Thank you so much. Um, another question has to do with what happens if the catheter gets blocked and you're at home? What should you do? So usually it's an easy fix. So it's not often that anything uh, needs to be done urgently. So usually what we tell people is just twisting the catheter. Um, is enough to form like a, uh, a pushing of the air, like in the in the direction of the of the bladder. So it'll dislodge that little clot that may be blocking or that tissue that's blocking the uh, the tip of the catheter. Usually, it doesn't require irrigating or flushing or anything like that. It usually means that you would take the tube and almost twist it, you know, in a counterclockwise. So one way you're twisting one way and the other way. So you're, you're almost doing like a, you're, you're closing it off. And it shins um, enough air pressure to dislodge that small clot. So that's what we usually instruct people to do. Great. Thank you for that. Um, definitely good information for people to understand. Um, one individual has asked the question, does the doctor or the nurse refer patients to community care access, or is that something that the patient would need to um, set out and organize for themselves? Something they would need to be uh, organized themselves. It is not done, so it would be, uh, you would have to pay for it, so it is not covered by OHIP if it's not ordered by a physician. So institutions do not order community care access. Uh, for individuals um, after prostate surgery because there is no reason for a community care access nurse to be in the home. Great, thanks.
how often does one get the side effects? So I know you talked about various side effects. Could you give a quick overview of how frequent some of those complications would occur? So uh, blood clots would be very low. So again, things are, um, you have to also take into account predisposing factors. So uh, somebody with a cardiac history, somebody with high cholesterol, um, you know, if they have, they may be at a higher risk for developing. Somebody with varicose veins may be at a higher risk for developing blood clots. Um, so somebody without a lot of comorbidities, it would be like a very low incidence, um, maybe like less than 2% when it comes to prostate surgery. It may be 3% with the robotic just because of the positioning in the operating room. So um, that's where they would wear the um, anti-embolic stockings to kind of help with the circulation. So um, it's really not common with the uh, blood clot bleeding. A lot of it, again, depends on the skill of the surgeon. Uh, some surgeons do a lot of surgery. Some surgeons don't do as many. So a lot of it is the skill of the surgeon. So um, that's a question that people should ask their uh, surgeon um, because they would measure what their outcomes are. Uh, for us here, we have a 2% uh, transfusion rate for our patients, which is actually very low. And again, we take into consideration if somebody does have a large prostate, uh, we know they're probably going to bleed, so we're going to have them donate their blood. So it's sort of taking precautions and being aware of what the needs are and then sort of looking in advance and saying, we're going to have you donate so we can use your blood. So um, it's sort of being aware of what we need to do ahead of time. Uh, wound infections really, really not common. So it's very rare that anybody would come back in. Um, to the hospital. So what would happen is if they would come in, they would notice that um, the incision where the staples are are red, it would be hot, it would be swollen, um, there could be some pus coming out. So if somebody's at home and that happens shortly after they're discharged from the hospital, we usually will tell people to go to uh, their family physician or we'll bring them back into the clinic to have a look and see and we'll start them on some antibiotics that would kind of cover um, that, but it's really not common as long as people are really sort of like showering and patting the area dry and keeping that area, you know, without, um, um, you know, lotions and creams and that. So wound infections, very rare. Urinary tract infection, same thing. It's very rare. Uh, people are covered with antibiotics um, before and uh, shortly after surgery. Before the, <clears throat> excuse me, before the catheters come out, we usually will order people antibiotics to take it the day before and a few days after the catheter is removed because that's when the evidence supports that people would get a urinary tract infection because that's when you're colonizing the bladder uh, with any bacteria when you're removing the, the catheter. So that's the important time frame of, of having the antibiotics the day before and a few days after the cath removal. Great. Thank you, Leah, for all that information. Just a couple more quick questions and then conscious of time, we will need to cut off the webinar. We do have a question regarding whether or not uh, cancer is contagious and whether it could be passed through bodily fluids from one person to another. So with prostate cancer, no. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and then I think I have one other question here. Is there anything different if there's a person who is overweight? Is there anything significantly different that they would need to do before surgery? There isn't things that they need to do significantly, um, but they, they are going to have a little bit of a harder time. So I know when I am meeting somebody in the pre-admission department, if somebody has a large belly and they're significantly overweight, I do explain to them that the, um, the continent is going to more than likely uh, take longer for them not to have to wear the pad because they've got 20 or 30 pounds. It's putting pressure on an already weakened, um, you know, sphincter um, and muscles in the area. So um, if somebody is significantly um, overweight, um, we do see patients um, or men far enough in advance that we do have a wellness program. Sometimes if they don't live within the GTA, we do encourage them to, um, you know, go to the gym or go to the Y for somebody who is really overweight. Um, swimming uh, really is a non-impact, but really helps to uh, tone the muscles. It helps to um, clear the lungs, expand the lungs so you're getting better oxygenation. Um, it helps with your cardiac output, which helps with the circulation, which helps with the healing. So 
Um, we really, if somebody is significantly overweight, we will sometimes offer them a nutritionist that they should see. And we usually, depending on the size of someone, we have had people go on a program before we would operate on them. Great, thank you for that. I have one last question, um, and then we'll need to close off the webinar. But an individual has asked if they should bring their CPAP machine um, for breathing when they go in for their surgery. So they should bring their CPAP in because um, mm -hmm. we don't have CPAPs, and the number of people that um, actually are diagnosed with sleep apnea is very high. So uh, the hospital doesn't have that many, and it's a, a type of equipment that's very difficult to sort of change from person to person because everybody has their own settings. So institutions will tell people to bring in their CPAPs. Great. Thank you so much, Leah. Um, and I do know, just before I close off, there was one question around where we would find the recorded webinars on our website. So if you go to prostatecancer.ca, up along the top, you'll see some options, and one of them is supporting you. If you hover over that link, it will show here from the experts, and it enables you to tune into the live one, and there's also an option for you to click on past presentations, and they are all broken down in various categories there, so that's where you'll find the information on our website. Leah, I want to thank you once again for your patience and perseverance, um, as well as all the participants, uh, for getting the webinar started and uh, for staying on a little bit longer this evening to answer everyone's questions. It was very informative. And I think, as I said earlier, some very practical information for people. So thanks so much for everything you've done for this webinar. And I also want to gratefully acknowledge the support of our sponsors, Abby, Estellis, and Jansen who will make this webinar series possible with their support. Our next webinar will be on Tuesday, January 31st at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time with Bill Landry on the topic of physiotherapy and prostate cancer, focusing on incontinence and pelvic floor exercises. If you are looking for further information on prostate cancer, please connect with our helpline at 1-855-PCC-INFO or email at support at prostatecancer.ca. Thanks, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your evening.